Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Greetings and welcome everybody to another edition of our reading of this wonderful little book, The Divine Program of the World's History by Albert Close. And today we have March 8, 2019, and I'm gathered here with your Glissman and Daryl Eberhardt again. And we are about to embark on a very interesting study, one of which goes pretty much way over my head, but we can definitely see that there are some marvelous things to come when our Lord returns. And I think both of my brothers in Christ would agree that this is uh, probably a little bit, uh, well, what can we say? A can of worms that we opened with this book here? Can Daryl? No, yeah, I, I guess we, we could say that. Go ahead, Jerk. No, I, I just wanted to agree with him, but I wanted to give you the floor first, because after that, I'm going to start the reading anyway, so sure. please take your well, time, just, Daryl. I'll just say that I'm glad to be on with both of you. I'm glad that I found some of my old books that have been buried away in my breezeway, in my cellar, piled up in my living room, almost to the ceiling, weighing 150, 160 pounds, which for a guy with a stroke isn't easy to move, but I've tracked down not all of them, but I just found a couple of my books by Timothy Kaufman. Timothy F. Kaufman wrote a book quite contrary 
about, it's called the subtitle, The Biblical Reconsideration of the Apparitions of Mary, and Yerk and I talked about that the other day. And he wrote a book also, and by the way, Richard Bennett really likes Timothy Kaufman's books here, and they, uh, I think at one time, offered them or mentioned them in their ministry, Bree and Beacon, but Graven Bread was his other one, and it's subtitled The Papacy, The Apparitions of Mary, and The Worship of the Bread on the Altar. So I like it. I sort of like the old books back in the 1800s, because the subtitle was a uh, half a page long, and it told you exactly what was in the book. So you could just read the title and the subtitle on these books back in the 1800s, like by Samuel Morrison, it would give you... You, you wouldn't have to write much of a description on what the book had in it because the subtitle told what was in it. But anyway, I'm grateful that there's been people out there like Timothy Kaufman, at least a couple of decades ago, maybe closer to three, that these guys were writing books, uh, Dave McPherson exposing uh, the preacher of rapture and a lot of the dispensationalism, C.I. Schofield, etc. I know we're going to talk about something different today, but the thing is, is that we've had people out there exposing this evil, the lies that have been put out, all this futurist, I hate to use the word garbage, but it's, well, it's in fantasy, fantasies, how about that? Futurist fantasies that has made a lot of people a whole lot of money on, like, left behind series books and movies and DVDs, and they're making a lot of money off of a futurist scenario that doesn't line up with the Bible. The Bible talks about the historicist version that, of the viewpoint of uh, Bible prophecy, and that's what the Reformers all taught, that's what Puritan scholars taught, and that's what uh, Yerk and Brett and I and others, are try- to, uh, uh, Tom Fress, are trying to let folks know about is that, hey, we've been told a lot of lies and we need to do a little bit of homework. We really need to get into our Bible. So with that said, good to be on with both of you. Thank you, Daryl. I would just like to take it on that you said uh, futurist f- fable. What did you say? Um, no? Fantasy. Uh, fantasy, yeah. I would I would call it, you know, uh, because the people like the word science fiction, I would like to call <laughs> it futurist fiction. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that they know it is science fiction and the bible speaks in this regard of science so called yeah you know mm-hmm. pseudoscience as we call it because it's all built on gnosticism it's built on the knowledge of man it is built on the teachings of man and futurism is nothing else but the man made fable of a future yep. antichrist absolutely taken out of the context of the bible only to be understood if you don't let the Bible do its work, which is to lead you into all truth. That is what Jesus Christ promised us when he went to heaven, that he had to go away so the Comforter would come, and that Comforter would lead us into all truth. That was true at the time of the Pentecost, and that is still true of the time of today. Pentecost is long gone. Yeah, Pentecost yeah. is long gone and fulfilled, but the working of the Holy Spirit in, the, in that regard, that he leads you into all truth, that is still valid today. Yeah? Yeah, and let's not forget to tell folks that futurism was invented, it was designed uh, by Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, and it was designed to get the proverbial spotlight or the onus of being identified with the Antichrist off of the papacy, the office of the popes, the office of the papacy, that's what all of the reformers didn't agree on everything, but one thing they did agree on, all of them, the major key reformers agreed, that the papacy, the office of the popes, was the Antichrist, and that was the historicist prophetic viewpoint of the Bible. It's the correct one. And, uh, yeah, let's get on with the reading, and so good again to be on with both of you. Yeah, so we are here together today to continue in the reading of the Divine Program of the World's History by Albert Close. It is the 16th session that we are doing in this reading. And I can tell you, this is a session like, or I'm going to read something that I have never done before. Because up to now, I always was sure of what I read was true, measured to the Bible. But we are dealing now with some things 
that I, even when I measure it at the Bible, I just don't have the complete understanding. What I am telling you confidently is that the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church concerning the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14 is baloney. I told that in the past, I tell that now, I tell that in the future. If the explanation that we get from Albert Close, and he just took it, by the way, from Henry Gretton Guinness, is true, I don't know. But it makes much more sense, but there are still some terms that need to be explained, that need to be well understood, and that need to be studied, and I pray, therefore, that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth as we are reading these papers, because we are not only reading of the Divine Program today, we are also going to do a read of the Edict of Toleration. And if you have never heard of that, the Edict of Toleration of 1844, well, you're just like me. A week ago, I have never ever heard of it. It's completely new to me, and therefore it is wonderfully of importance in the understanding of the mystery of Daniel's prophecy. Why do I call it the mystery of Daniel's prophecy? Because some things in the prophet Daniel, like some things in the prophet John, are still a mystery to us. We are always able to measure things, history, to prophecy when it has been fulfilled. But sometimes we just cannot see how something has been fulfilled in the past. Maybe because we are too close to it. And I'm going to give you one example before I start the reading. I think this is very profound. If you understand the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 to be the United States of America, you know the United States of America, that land mass of America, of that new world, has been, quote-unquote, discovered. It has been um, taken possession of by Christopher Columbus in 1492, right? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yeah, You know the story better than I do, you yeah. American guys. And of course, Columbus did not sail into the blue. He knew where he was going to end. He had an order. He had an order to conquer the new world for the Pope and consecrate it to Mary. And that's what he did. My point is, that was 1492. And Daryl so correctly said that all the reformers pinned the Antichrist to the papacy. And when all these reformers were asked about the two beasts, nobody, not one, ever mentions America, that new world, the later coming United States of America as the second beast. Why? Well, first of all, maybe because it's not that. That's another study that we still have to do, and we promise to do that during the reading of the Divine Program, that we have to go deeper into, chapter, in, into um, Revelation chapter 13 to understand if the assumption the author makes that the first beast is the Vatican and the second beast is the Roman Catholic Church because it is a ecclesiastical on the one hand and a temporal power on the other hand and therefore these two beasts is it and it is not the United States of America. I'm, I'm still not sure of that. I haven't studied it yet. But the point is that no one of the reformers ever mentioned this quote-unquote beast out of the earth could be America probably because they were all a little bit too close to the history of that fact. When the continent was quote-unquote discovered in 1492, and Martin Luther translated his Bible just some 30 years after that, and Calvin and all the other um, reformers were living during the 16th century, they were living within 100 years after the discovering quote-unquote discovering of that continent. They probably could not see if that would be fulfilled this way. 
But I don't even hear Henry Gretton Guinness or James Edgar Wiley talk on that subject in the way that is the United States of America. And they were speaking of the 19th century. So why is that? You know, when you go to the Internet, there is a table out there that you can find on, um, I don't know on what website, you have to look that up for yourself, but there is a table out, uh, out that you can find where you see all the reformers and their statements on Revelation chapter 13, beast number one and beast number two. And nobody of all the reformers listed there of the 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th century, not one of them mentions that United States of America or America altogether is the second beast. Probably because a lot of them were too close to it. Now my point is, we are going now into an explanation of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. We are going into an uh, understanding of the prophecy that was given to Daniel about the sanctuary that has been closed and when, when that is, and that was 2,300 days. Maybe we today are still too close to that event that we can really see what has been fulfilled or not. And that is the concern that I have that for the very first time I'm sitting down, I'm doing a reading and I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I know what I'm talking about, but I hope you understand what I mean. I am not... Yeah, and you're... Yeah, please. Can I say something real quick? And that is, is yes, that uh, we don't need to necessarily be 100% sure on all of these things because 99% of the Bible is not necessarily going to tell you something that's going to happen tomorrow or two days away. The main thing about the Bible is, is that, as we've said many times, it's the operating manual for the human soul we need to have our noses in the entire Bible. We need to be studying Psalms. We need to be studying Proverbs because there's a lot of wisdom in there. There's a lot of advice on how to do prayers. We need to be studying the Old Testament, some of the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, because we get to see people that had the courage to stand up in their time to kings and get their fingers in a king's face, such as Nathan even did the prophet Nathan in David's face and said, Thou art the man. We, it's with courage. We can find courage by reading that. So we need to, like Lincoln said, we need to be obeying what we can understand. If we can't figure out exactly who the two beasts are right at this second, and if we take a guess, we may be wrong. The, the key thing to understand is, is that papal Rome is running the world right now. They're controlling the international banking community slash finance slash economic that entire community. They're running the diplomatic community, pretty much. They're running the geopolitical situation and the banking system again. They're running everything. They're controlling things. They're creating the wars, and they're planning probably on killing maybe a, start having a war that's going to kill billions, not millions, billions. Our main concern right now is to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, the Bible, and to talk about who the Antichrist is. We promote, we exalt the Christ, and we expose the Antichrist. That's our main job. If we don't figure out who the two witnesses are, who the two beasts are exactly, what does it matter? The matter is, is that papal Rome right now is controlling all the major power levers of our world, including the financial side, and they have evil on their minds because they're doing the deeds of their daddy. And I don't think there's any need to explain who their daddy is. Okay, I'm sorry. I just thought that was necessary no, to say. No, don't we be need to... sorry. Don't be sorry, Daryl. Yeah. That is wonderful what you just said, and I have to say I couldn't have said it better, and actually I am normally the one who says things like that. So <laughs> it's nice that you set the record straight for that. But I just wanted to let the listeners know, because you know when they are used to listen to my uh, recordings, whether it's in German or in English, they know that normally I talk about things that I'm sure of, that I know. And mm -hmm. today... I'm going on uh, a new terrain, on a new ground, because I don't actually have the knowledge of what I'm talking about. This is also why I'm not, and you are not, and Brett is not dogmatic about what we are saying. No. Uh, we are just putting up another quote-unquote theory, another understanding, because one thing you, Brett, and I totally agree on, that baloney, the Seventh-day Adventists teach in that regard, is baloney. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, that's right. Yeah. And they're that, they're and an that organization that was totally infiltrated. A, they're a perfect example of the Jesuits setting up a false front. So, yeah, they are... Yeah. 
There is a lot yeah. of this stuff that is put out as red herrings to get us again looking down the wrong rabbit hole. Yeah, looking down a facade, the wrong trail. a false front. Mm-hmm. Yep. A nice big facade for everyone to mm-hmm. look at. Oh, yeah, look at those Christians. Uh, they're, what sect are they again? Oh, they're the Seventh-day Adventists, the ones that worship on Saturday. See, so whoever you are, and you tell your Christian friends that you worship, well, you rest. Excuse me, there's a difference. Sabbath is a day of rest. It's a day of rest. So when you rest on Sabbath and you tell your Christian friends and they say, oh, well, you're a Seventh-day Adventist then. No, I just observe the Sabbath. There is a difference. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is a fantastic study we got. And I think the, the top of page 68, the first paragraph, pretty much nails it down really well. Because it speaks of the, um, how do we say this now, the 2300 years and the Mohammedan power here described in Daniel chapter 8 verses 1 through 27 that we read earlier in the last session and how it kind of draws this to the 1844 mark and Yerk is going to start reading this soon I would Mm -hmm. imagine but uh, you know I just can't help but agree with you guys that yeah this is quite a bit over our heads because we're we're peering into this this prophecy that has been completely uh, how do you want to say this destroyed uh, completely wiped out and it's never talked about who do you who do you hear talk about the seven times you know that what is it the two thousand five hundred and twenty years, I mean, uh, and it's mentioned here on two thousand five hundred twenty lunar versus solar years. Where do you ever hear about this lunar versus solar years? What is a lunar year anyway? I mean, it it's really confusing to someone that has never studied this before, and really frustrating. But that's what prophecy is not defined by men. It is not defined by Yerk or myself or Daryl. It says in the Bible in the book of Revelation, isn't it? In chapter 19, verse 10, that uh, the, the spirit of prophecy is, oh, I got to look it up. I'm sorry. I'm winging it now. I think you want to say that uh, no prophecy of this book is for personal interpretation. Well, that too, Yerk. Absolutely right. It's That's something not that for we have to that we have to, to keep in uh, mind, right? Define. That's right. You know, that's absolutely right. But what I was thinking of was this: uh, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's his testimony that is determining the prophecy and it's up to us to get it right and and to bring it to our brethren but we can't really do that in, entirely today we are kind of running on on what uh, Henry Grattan Guinness is telling us here and I think that's it for me for now good then I'm going to start the reading in the book The Divine Program of the World's History I'm going to go one um, paragraph back to the end of the page before to read the complete first paragraph on page 68. And it says, It must be borne in mind that no sooner did the Roman Empire cease to tread down Jerusalem than the Muslim power began to do so, and has continued to do so to this day. The utmost efforts of Christendom expended in eight different crusades failed to drive the Muslim out of the Holy Land. For twelve centuries he has defiled the sanctuary and stood up against the prince of princes, casting down the truth to the ground, practicing and prospering. But it is written that when this period of 2,300 days comes to an end, quote, he shall be broken without hand and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, today we're going to start reading at this. First, then, 
with reference to the earlier of the two terminations of the 2300 years already named. From before Christ 457, 2300 years leads to the incipient, incipient beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844, when Turkey signed the first decree of toleration. Now, who has ever heard of the decree of toleration of 1844? I have never. So, I told Brett and Daryl that this needs further study of ourselves to get ourselves familiar with the understanding of what he is talking about here. Yeah? So here we should actually start our next reading. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to read without many interruptions until the end of this chapter, which is for the next little bit more than two pages. And then we will go into the understanding of the decree of toleration to make something out of it and to get a better understanding of what the author tells us here. Let it be remembered, the author says, that all great movements have almost imperceptible commandments, just as great rivers spring from little brooks. Israel's restoration and the destruction of Mohammedan rule, meaning the cleansing of the sanctuary, are not events to be accomplished in a day or in a year, any more than the overthrow of the city and temple and national existence of the Jewish people was accomplished in a day or in a year. From Ephraim's earliest down to Judah's latest, uh, Judah's latest captivity, a hundred and sixty-eight years elapsed, and similarly at the restoration, from the first edict of Cyrus to the second of Artaxerxes, ninety-two years elapsed. We need not marvel then to find that this greater restoration from this more than thirty times longer dispersion should apparently be destined to occupy a period of seventy-five years. Now, in the year 1844, for the first time since the days of Muhammad, the founder of Islam, when the sanguinary laws of, the religious, uh, of religious intolerance were enacted, the Turkish Sultan was obliged by the European powers to promise to relinquish the practice of executions for apostasy and to make a decree granting religious toleration. Of course, the promise has been broken, but it marked a stage in the loss of Turkish independence. From that date to the present time, remember, Albert Close writes this book 1916. That is very important when we come to the next times that you see on the end of the next page here. So, 1916 he talks about. From that date to the present time, a process of elevation and incipient restoration of Israel has been going on. It has been so quiet, so gradual, so unobtrusive, that few have noticed it. The turn of the tide has taken place, but the current has not yet set sufficiently strong in the other direction to attract attention. Yet the careful observer cannot fail to note the evident and rapid fall of Turkey and the incipient revival of Palestine. Jerusalem has not yet ceased to be trodden underfoot. But what of the two great powers which for 1800 years, with a few brief intervals, have successively trodden her down? Rome and the various forms of that Mohammedan power, whose present head is Turkey. Rome trod down Jerusalem in the days of Titus, and Turkey holds her down now. Rome cast her to the ground, and when she was down, Turkey set its foot on her neck. Rome hurled her to the dust. Turkey trampled her in the mire. Rome destroyed God's temple and ploughed it up, uh, up ploughed, ploughed up the sacred site on which it stood. Speaking of 70 A.D., Turkey maintains the mosque of Omar on that sacred site, and on the holy hill where Abraham offered Isaac, where David offered an oxen to uh, Aaron. Arayuna, where Solomon built his temple and where the Lord Jesus, the son of David, cast out all that was unholy, there, by Turkish authority, now stands a Mohammedan mosque, and there no Jew is permitted 
even to set his foot. I could already do so many comments on what I just read of things that I just don't understand, but I think that we have to keep in mind that there is only one salvation by Jesus Christ, through Jesus right. Christ alone, and there is no different salvation for the Jews, and there is, in my understanding, absolutely no need to call anything in Jerusalem today holy. Martin Luther, in his work of the Babylonian captivity, said, the cows in Switzerland are as holy as the quote-unquote <laughs> Holy Land Jerusalem is today. <laughs> yeah, Because God does not dwell in temples made of stone anymore. So there is even something that this author doesn't tell us in the way that is biblically to, biblically to be understood. Jerusalem being trodden down from the Gentiles, yeah, all right, but Jerusalem is not the holy city anymore. The only holy city of Jerusalem that I know and that you know is the one that Jesus brings along when he comes back. And nothing the New here, Jerusalem. Yeah, the New Jerusalem. And nothing here in this world is holy. Because only one can make something holy. He who is holy. And he is not here to make anything holy in this Antichrist world. Yeah? I just needed to say this, you know, for, for a That's better correct. understanding. So I'm, I'm not completely agreeing with everything the author says here. But historically viewed, this is very interesting what he tells us about here. That Jerusalem has been trodden down by the Gentiles, Rome and Mohammedism, ever since that time. For at the time when he writes, about 1800 years. Yeah. The second starting point, the author continues, from which these 2,300 day, uh, years may be dated, is the era of Seleucidae, before Christ 312. Seleucidae were the race of monarchs descended from Seleucius Nicator, one of the four notable horns of the he-goat from which Antiochus Epiphanes sprang. So, just to make sure that you understand this correctly, we are speaking of when the Grecian Empire fell into four after the death of uh, Alexander the Great, and it was parted into four parts, and the Seleucia were one of the parts that they got. And this is what it's talking about. At this era of Seleucidae, long used by the Jews themselves and still employed by the Nestorians, and if you want to know the Nestorians, you can, I advise you to go to this wiki article of Nestorianism and learn about them, but that is much too far to go into for our reading here. And other Eastern nations is dated from the great founder of the dynasty of, pre, uh, of Precursory, Little Horn. It is not an unsuitable point of departure. The period of 2,300 years measured from it and reckoned in lunar years runs out in AD 1919-1920. So that's three to four years from the time in the future from the time Albert Close writes this book. And this, and that is a very important point he makes, is 75 years later than its first termination in 1844. And the same year as the main measurement of the times of the Gentiles dated from Nebuchadnezzar's overthrow of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in BC 602. Is this period of 75 years, from 1844 to 1919, 1920, to be the era in which the 2300 years are to run out? and the Turkish Empire, or Eastern Little Horn, driven from the Holy Land and possibly completely broken without hand as an empire? Time will declare. So let us watch and wait. And this is the most intelligent sentence I have read the last ten minutes. Let us watch and wait, the author says. Maybe that is just what we today too have to do, being patient until our Lord reveals it all to us, or until enough time passed, uh, until enough time passed by to make biblical sense of what we were reading here. Time will declare, so let us watch and wait, and let us, and let us not try to make stupid... Um, predictions for the future that then don't come out 
and only take away from our credibility. Let's see what the Bible tells us. Let's see what the author tells us. You will see I marked here the 75 years. I'm going into a little comment right there because this is really something I don't understand. But maybe you can help me. Maybe Brett can help me. Maybe Daryl can help me. And if they can help me, maybe you who watches this video can help me by putting into the comment the true understanding. The next sentence is, the difference between 2520 true lunar and the same number of true solar years is 75 years. Now, as Brett mentioned already earlier, did you ever study what a lunar year is? Did you ever study what a solar year is? And are you even aware of that the biblical year again is something else? Well, listen to, or look, look to this little comment that I wrote. The solar calendar is a measure of the Earth's rotation around the Sun. There already is the very first problem I have, because the Earth is not rotating around the Sun. Okay? So, this solar calendar is already based on something that is a lie, because the Earth is stationary. I'm not discussing whether the Earth is flat or round or sphere or whatever, but I'm telling you the Earth is stationary, and it is the center of the universe, because in the beginning God created the heaven and the Earth. Right? And he creates everything like an intelligent being out from the center and not somewhere in the corner or something. And the Earth is not flying around with 66,000 miles per hour. Okay? So, here's already one problem that we have. The solar calendar is a measure of Earth's rotation around the Sun. So, when the Earth does not rotate around the Sun, how can there be a solar calendar that is accurate? Point one. Next sentence. A year on the solar calendar has an average of 365.24 days. The lunar calendar is a measure of the moon's rotation around the Earth. A year of the lunar calendar has 354 days. So there is a difference of 11 days almost between those. A biblical year, on the other hand, and this is the third thing that is never talked about when you go out there on the internet and research things of the solar year or lunar year, they never mention a biblical year. A biblical year has 360 days, so it's right in the middle, right in between those two. Isn't that like you have preterism? The Antichrist is fulfilled in the past. <laughs> Futurism of the Antichrist is being fulfilled in the future. But what is the true teaching? Historicism. That's in the middle of those two. Yep, everything ah. is being fulfilled as we speak. Exactly. And mm -hmm. a biblical year with 360 days lies exactly in the middle between 354 and 365. So, maybe the truces were again in the middle, right? In this regard. Now, I did a little calculation, and I'm not a very smart guy, but I can tell you that 2,520 years multiplied by 365.24 days makes a total of 920,405 solar year days. That's the maximum days we have. You can also do that with the lunar calendar, and then you come out to 2,520 times 354, which gives you 892,080 lunar days. There's a big difference between 892 and 920, right? That's about 38,000 difference. But also you have biblical days, and then it will be 2,520 times 360, which is 907,200. Now, mm -hmm. let us take the solar year, uh, solar year days, which is 920,405 minus the lunar days, and we will have a difference of 28,325 days. Okay? Now, when you put these, the difference in years, whether solar lunar or biblical, you get 77, 80 or 78.68. You never come down to 75. So I don't know how the author here says the difference between 2,520 true lunar and the same number of true solar years is 75 years. Because when I do the math, as it is counted here, I come to a difference between 77, 78.68 or 80 years, not 75. 
and I have to admit, this is too hard for me. Maybe I'm too stupid to count. I don't know. I was very good in school when it was about counting. I was a bitch when it was on mathematics, arithmetics. I couldn't do any of that. But pure counting, calculating, I was very good in. But I don't come to 75. Maybe I missed something. Maybe I have become so much dumber in the last 50 years. I don't know. You guys tell me. But I can make it up to come to 75 years difference. I understand the story of the author, why the 75 years is so important. Because when you say that the fall of the Ottoman Empire was put in with this edict of tolerance of 1844 that we are starting to talk about, and it took 75 years until it came to full fruition in 1919, which is the smashing apart of the Ottoman Empire after the First World War, I agree with him that are historical facts that I cannot deny, and that are exactly 75 years, but I cannot see exactly 75 years here in between. As I told you, it's maybe me, I don't know. But I know one thing, God is a better counter than me. And God doesn't make mistakes. And if he ordains that it is so, then it is so. But with these calculations that I can make here, I never come to exactly 75 years. How about you, Daryl, Brett? You know what? I, To be honest with you, Yerk, I'm not concerned about any of this. I'm concerned about obeying what I understand in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I don't know, I don't think, well, and I've just given you my opinion. I think it's much more important to obey what it says. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. In other words, do not commit murder, pre-planned murder, etc., that's a lot more important yeah. than is if our mathematics right. is going to work out on this. I don't see this as being maybe a, a big deal in, in knowing exactly why 75 doesn't exactly come out. It's much more important that we realize we need to be giving warnings to people, that we need to be telling them to read the Bible, study the Bible, obey what you do understand, and ask for greater guidance for what we don't understand and uh, concentrate on studying the Bible as much as we can, because we need to read the Gospels, the four Gospels, and know Jesus' words. <laughs> we need to know who he is. You can't get to know the Lord Jesus Christ without reading his words and seeing what he had to say. He, he said, but, but whom do ye say that I am? You know, there were people running around making, oh, he's one of those prophets, he's such and such, he's such and such. But Jesus boiled it down to his disciples, but whom do ye say that I am? Whom do ye say? We're to be looking and finding out what the Lord Jesus Christ wants of us. We're to be obeying him as to the best of our ability. We're to be supporting and helping our Christian brothers and sisters. And, so, and maybe because I didn't have a great love for mathematics that I, I just don't get real super concerned about this. It's good to understand things like this, but if it doesn't work out right away, like you said before, you're, we're going to see this stuff all fulfilled. It's, it, most of it's been fulfilled already. Uh, the little bit at the end of the time that, that we're not 100% sure of, we don't need to be concerned about. We need to be concerned, like Lincoln said, about obeying what we do understand. So I don't know if I'm taking a cop out on that. It's just that math nope. was never a big big thing of mine, and, and I agree with Lincoln. Our problem is not understanding. Our problem is obeying. I, un and that's I, I, agree, line. I agree 100% with you, Daryl. The point is mm -hmm. that only I want to make sure that the listener understands that this is a new terrain and a new ground that right. we're going on. Because sure. normally I always read books that I even understand better than the author sometimes does. Like, for example, mm -hmm. Rulers of Evil or something. That's like Tom Fress, you know, when he takes a book to the microphone and he reads the book. He's not only explaining the book, uh, reading the book, but he's also explaining the book. He's giving information that goes much beyond that, what even right. the author put in the book or understood of it. Sure. Now, when we are going to read this book, the divine history of world's, uh, the divine program of world's history, and we come to these parts that there is something in that we don't understand. That's why I said I don't, I, I am not dogmatic about things. The only thing right. that I am dogmatic about is telling you that don't believe what the SDA teaches. 
Right. Because that's baloney. But I yep. cannot give you a full alternative to that because I don't understand it fully. And that's when I rely to what you said, Daryl. That's so wonderful that you bring this up and not for the first time today. We should more worry about obeying the word of God and understanding mm -hmm. what yep. Jesus told us and should understand that the Antichrist is not some Jew or whatever person that comes in the far future for a few years, but that the papacy is, was and always will be the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. Those are important things and I absolutely agree with you. I just wanted to say this because right. this recording today is a premiere for most of the people who view videos that I do that all of a sudden I am confronted with something an author says that I cannot cope with, that I cannot measure against the Bible, that I do not have the complete understanding that's in there. That's why I am absolutely not dogmatic about it, but I'm just telling you this is what the author says and you deal with mm -hmm. it. Maybe you are smarter than me. You know, I tried to figure it out with these calculations. I couldn't come out on 75 years. Is that important? Well, more or less, yes. Less in my understanding, less in your understanding, less in Brett's understanding. It doesn't matter. God said it would be so. The point is, we are speaking about this 2300 day year prophecy. And we're just putting out that everything that you heard about this, the quote unquote, investigative judgment, <laughs> a fulfilling, a fulfilling, and that's the most, that's the biggest lie of them all from the Seventh day Adventists, a fulfilling of Bible prophecy here on earth is being fulfilled in heaven where no man can measure it on, where no man can see it, no man can prove it happens. They are saying, oh, Jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place, and now he is doing an investigative judgment. Hello. <laughs> uh, what kind of baloney is, me, is that? You know? And I cannot offer a 100% sure alternative to this. This is my point. But right. I can show you other ways to think about this. And what Albert Close puts out here in this book is the closest to a reasonable understanding that I have ever come to. Because there's also an understanding that I heard some months ago, or maybe it's already more than a year, from Nicholas Arthur from First Amendment Radio, who said that was fulfilled in 2300 literal days, with the rebuilding of the temple after the Jewish uh, captivity in Babylon, somewhere in Ezra. But I couldn't find any fault of using the day-year principle in that. And all of a sudden, only in chapter 8 verse 14 they are speaking of real days and not prophetic days meaning day years and the day year principle I couldn't find anything that proves that that's why I haven't contacted Nicholas Arthur even up to now because I always had my doubts on that you know so the point is what is the real understanding and your point Daryl that you say, well, it's all not of that importance. More important is that we keep the commandments as Jesus Christ ordered us to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. And that we go out there in the world and preach the people the gospel uh, as Jesus commanded us. Go out and teach mm -hmm. or preach the gospel <clears throat> to every creature. Uh, that's what we are doing. That is important. I absolutely agree. I just wanted to make very sure that the people understand that I am hitting new ground here and I want to make sure that everybody understands that I am not dogmatic about this but I like the way the author proposes this viewpoint of the 2300 days even though it has also its flaws. That's why I said there's nothing holy in this world anymore. And why should, sure. there be, why should there be re, uh, why should there be Come a in. restored yeah directly why should there be a restored nation state of Israel and Jerusalem and temple biblically when there's only one way to salvation and that is through faith in Christ alone through grace alone please Brad yeah I just yeah. wanted to quick uh, say something about this. Uh, this part of the book is just through me. I was really upset uh, when I read this, uh, the difference between the true lunar and the true solar. I think this throws a big, huge, uh, how do I want to say it? 
Monkey a wrench? very difficult, tough, yes, a monkey wrench. Throws a big monkey wrench into our discussion on this because the author doesn't say why. Uh, why can I say, are we putting the difference between true solar and lunar years into the, this seven times? Why bring up the seven times without mentioning it's the seven times? I mean, in other words, what we're doing is we're reading an his, historical book that has obviously a lot of teaching that has been way, way lost in history. I mean, we are really digging into the nitty-gritty here. And this is not an easy thing, but the Bible's e a lot easier because in Daniel chapter 8, verse 3 then I lifted up mine eyes, and I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. So, right there, we can see we have the Mohammedan or the Eastern power, and then we have the Roman or the Western power. And... Now the Mohammedan has been, how do you want to say, subdued or... Uh, yeah, subdued is a good word. Yeah, I mean, it's been dealt with now. So that is the fulfilling of the prophecy. I think that's beautiful. But to throw this monkey wrench in, it just... Uh, it would be great if the author would give us a footnote and go on some pages about why, but we don't have that, so... I, yeah. I wouldn't worry a whole lot about it because, number one, is, is that the calendar systems got changed and messed around with quite a bit. Yeah. And if my understanding is correct, in the old days, most of your civilizations were on a lunar calendar. That is a 30-day calendar. Whenever you start getting onto the current calendars like the Gregorian and that the Pope Gregory came up with and that, when you get into those calendars, you get leap years and everything, because you're working on a 365 instead of a 360-day year, depending on whether you got leap year and all that stuff in. And you add, So you have to keep adding a few days or that and here and there. And so it, it messed things up as far as the lunar calendars that were used by, I believe, most of the major, if not all of the major empires of the early Middle East used a 360 day a year and then we switched over we changed the new year and everything so a lot that throws a lot of like you say a monkey wrench into things on trying to calculate some things but uh yeah i'm not as concerned about whether the gregorian calendar's error or whether uh, what's important is is we know that there's a christ and there's an antichrist and the antichrist is very visible to us he we can see him on tv the current mm -hmm. Antichrist is part of the office of the papacy, and his name is Pope Francis. So uh, I don't worry about this futurism stuff, which I'm, what I'm saying is I don't worry about all of the fables and the fiction that has come out about worrying about some end-time guy that most Christians never saw during their lifetime, and some of us may never see the last super Mr. Nasty future Antichrist, he's just going to be in a long line of the Pope. So what's the difference? The thing is, is that we know who the Christ is. We know who the Antichrist is. We know the Antichrist is currently, through the Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, ruling the entire earth pretty much right now. There's a few pariah, what they consider heretic nations that don't buckle up, but almost all the nations of the world have buckled under Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, which is a, as we mentioned, it's not just a religion, it's a geopolitical, financial juggernaut that crushes everyone under their feet, foments wars and revolutions, and fomented World War I and World War II, and in my mind, uh, when they 66 to 70 million people died during World War II, a lot of them through famine and pestilence, all the things that go along with wars. And these guys plan world wars ahead of time, decades even, maybe century ahead of time. And they've got a big war planned, 
And uh, it's going to take maybe billions of people's lives because in Revelation in chapter 6 and in chapter 9, it talks about, I think it's a, a quarter and then a third of the populate what's remaining, get killed. If you do the math, that comes up to half the world's population. And with chemical, biological, and uh, 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 nuclear weapons, their ability to kill billions, not just millions, as happened in World War II, tens of millions in World War II, that's my main concern, is obeying the Bible, getting the warning out to people. Like I put on, sign a lot of my emails that I send out with Ezekiel, 33 6 that says we're and if you read chapter 3 in ezekiel the same thing it says we're to be good watchmen on the wall if we see danger coming if we see the sword coming and we don't tell people we don't tell them that the mass murderer is in our neighborhood the world's neighborhood and every 30 to 50 years goes on a mass murder spree and did one as recently as a major one in world war ii but also have done some other pretty big genocides like in croatia in cambodia in Vietnam, I forget how many people, Korea, the Korean War, there were a lot of civilians, Korean civilians died, there were a lot of civilians died in the Vietnam War. That's my main concern. I know a lot of history, I think I know my Bible fairly well, and I know that nations that play the whore on God, as the northern kingdom of Israel did, the spiritual harlot, if you'd like, or, and the southern kingdom of Judah, they were God's people, but they kept stone in his prophets and kept sinning and killing people they were killing their children and because of the sins of manasseh of the king of judah god says that's it you guys are gone into captivity i'm going to bring the babylonians in to squash you just like i brought the assyrians in and squashed the northern kingdom of israel i'm tired of it you guys don't follow my rules and regulations and that's what the bible is it gives you the commandments of god and the manual on how to operate the human soul, but also the manual on how to operate your nation. And I think if we're all honest, we have to admit we haven't held our leaders as accountable as we should have through, and I can speak for America for sure, we haven't held our leaders accountable as we should have. And God says when you people, the people don't hold their leaders accountable, their religious leaders and their secular leaders accountable for how the nation's doing, then God brings punishment on that nation. It's, I believe, Psalm 917, all the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. We, and I don't know about Belgium and, and uh, Netherlands and uh, France and England, but I know from my country, the United States of America, we have forgotten God, period. And we're going to pay the price. Their judgment is coming on individuals, and judgment is coming on nations. The, they've done all kinds of studies, and the length of an empire is about 400 years. Do the math. America has overextended itself, much as the Roman Empire did militarily. We're involved in I don't know how many different countries, and just abortion alone ought to make us sit up in America as American citizens and wonder, What's going to befall our nation because God does not overlook the spilling of innocent blood, period. So, again, I think our main concern needs to be is obeying what we do understand and study our Bibles as much as we can and be in prayer for asking for discernment and guidance because we are living in very wicked times that the Lord Jesus Christ said would not get easier. He says it's like the pangs of giving birth. It's going to get worse and worse, wax worse and worse, to use the King James, wax worse and worse, and that is it's just going to get worse and worse. So we're living in very bad times, and we need to be warning folks what's going on. So again, um, that's what I think <laughs> right now. That was a very good closing statement, but we are not closing down yet, Daryl. <laughs> You know, I know, but I just that's important for us to know is that no, but we're living in very bad times. Yeah, wonderful. You really brought it down to the point. That was a very good uh, plaidoyer you gave there. Yeah, a very good yeah, plea. Yeah, no a doubt. A very good plea you gave. Absolutely, I agree. And it even focuses it even tighter on on the point of of trying to recover what's been lost too, right, guys? Yeah. 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 And I agree 100% on what you just said, like you so often agree 100% on what I just said. So, 
let me now please take a few minutes to bring this reading to an end for today because we are here on the last page before we come into another chapter and we still have to go next time when our reading we have to go into this 1844 edict to explain to the people a little bit more in detail what the author speaks about here but I want to just finish this page right now so it says here on the third paragraph on page 70, the difference between 2520 true lunar and the same number of true solar years, we just discussed that, is 75 years. In other words, the 75 years added in the prophecy is exactly equal to the impact of the whole seven times. If 2520 lunar and the same number of solar years begin together, the former will run out 75 years before the latter. The 75 years added to the times of the Gentiles are equal to the impact of that great dispensational period. The skillful navigator does not throw away his chart and pilot because he mistakes occasionally one headland for another further on. He, on the other hand, is still more watchful and ponders his sailing directions more and more. Ministers, however, act on the opposite principle. Because some incautious commentators have made mistakes, they throw away the whole guidebook and say to the very voyager, now don't look out for land or signs in the end of the voyage, just run right on, full speed, and when you run up on the shore, you will know that you are there. That is how our 20th century ministry advise men to treat God's great pilot book to the life beyond. Don't take any notice of science, they say. This is no exaggeration of the facts. Let any reader speak to ten ministers of the gospel about the approaching end of the age and the signs we are now witnessing, and nine out of the ten... <coughs> and nine out of the ten will arch their brows and point to the mistakes of the past and then look wise. But is it real wisdom? No, it is folly and disobedience to divine commands. Jesus Christ said, watch. What for? What for? And next time we will go into a hopefully better little study of this edict of, um, what's it called, uh, edict of toleration. Toleration. Yeah. yeah, and we are going into that next time. Uh, I don't have anything more to say to close this broadcast down. I think I said everything I wanted to say and... Uh, I'm still baffled at uh, what a wonderful understanding also Daryl uh, put on today and how he really brought the things to the point that we should read our Bible, study our Bible, believe what Jesus Christ said, and if we don't understand every word, well, like a child that doesn't understand his father, ask, what mm -hmm. did you just say? Can you help me understand it? Pray yeah. for a better understanding and not make up your own mind on these things, which so many people, especially, I'm sorry to say, the Seventh-day Adventists, very often, at least they, with an agenda, do so. They have an agenda to deceive. Take my word for it. You don't have to, but you can. With this, I'm going to close it down for myself, and I'm going to leave, of course, some closing comments to Brother Daryl and Brother Brett. Daryl. Please. Yeah, I'll just say uh, one thing in closing, and that is, is don't get hung up in uh, pyramidology and all of this stuff. Uh, that came along with Charles Taze Russell and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, a bunch of these folks that uh, want to get you outside of the Bible. They want to add to the Bible and say, you need to examine these different tunnels inside the Great Pyramid and to figure things out, and then you'll you better understand Bible prophecy. No, as Jerk just said, sit down, read the books that apply, that are applicable, such as the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. They go hand in hand, glove in glove, when you study those books, and then what you don't understand, and a lot of it is explained to you. If you'll read one, sometimes uh, 
couple verses later or a chapter later, they explain a lot of the symbology or that that's used in the Bible. And the Bible is basically a history. It told the history ahead of time. But when you study the, the Bible and then you check it against what's already ha- really happened in history, you're going to see that the Bible has a 100% track record on correctly predicting how things were going to line up in that. And it, it may not give us every single detail at the exact second that we think we need it, but what it's going to do is it's going to tell us who the real bad guys are. It's going to tell us who the good guys are throughout history. And those good guys are the ones that were the ones that believed God's word and preached it and warned people. And that's what we're trying to do. We're not saying we're good or anything. We're just, the more I study the Bible, the more I study history, the more, and people like Albert Close and that bring out a lot of good points, but the more I study, the more I realize how little I know. And, and for the most part, I can speak for America. We Americans are extremely biblically challenged as far as biblical history and as far as church history goes, etc. We need to we need to have our noses in our Bibles and that's all I got to say. Thanks guys for having me along. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Yerk, so much for being brothers in Christ and, and walking this narrow road along with me and many others that are listening because there are a lot of pitfalls in this day and age and very interesting uh, reading we did today and, you know, coming to this uh, this prophetic knowledge is not very easy. It's very difficult and it requires a lot of study independently and doing your own research. So, we encourage others to do that. And I know Yerk was, was saying about how uh, misleading uh, the Seventh-day Adventist teachings are. And I just want to add that uh, the Lutherans are no better at all. And I was in the Lutheran church for many, many years, raised Lutheran and made to go to church every Sunday, go to Sunday school every Sunday. And, uh, you know, I was actually very enthusiastic about learning about the Bible when I was young. And my parents were not so much. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be um, afraid about learning more about the Bible. You just need to do it in private and with prayer, because Jesus will reveal all truth as he promised to do. So, very well. We'll close the session down. God bless everybody. We'll catch up with you next time. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God?